So as Cody said, my name is Steve Price. I'm over in um, the Carbon County office. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about alfalfa insect pests, um, kind of how to monitor, um, ways you can get better control, and also some updates on research. Um, so a, a brief intro in integrated pest management. Um, this, this graph does a good job of, of trying to help me explain why it is that we need to be doing monitoring. So as the number of pests increase in a field, eventually they're going to start causing an, economic, um, an economically significant level of injury. Um, once that occurs, your control is going to be worth it financially to knock those pests back. However, below that threshold, it's not going to pay to spray. Um, it, it's so trying to get, trying to figure out whether your field is the, at this inflection point is going to be the key to one, not getting um, damage that's going to be significant for you and also not doing recreational spraying, which is an expensive hobby. Um, so monitoring throughout this, this curve to make sure you're, you're hitting this inflection point is, is a priority. So alfalfa weevil, um, this is probably our, our number one alfalfa pest throughout the state. Um, most of you are, I hope a majority of you have probably seen um, these sweep nets. So these sweep nets, they're kind of like a, something that looks like a butterfly net made out of canvas, uh, standard 15 inches. You can actually use these and by walking through the field and taking 180 degree sweeps, you can go and collect samples and then compare those samples to the threshold to see if it pays to spray. Is it worth your time and money to spray those insects? Um, a lot of people um, will use a, a hat or maybe even a square nose shovel and sweep that through the alfalfa. And that does a great job of telling you if there are weevils in the alfalfa, but what it doesn't do is tell you how many weevils are in that alfalfa. So really taking these 180 degree sweeps is the best way to go. I'll see if I can. So here's just a quick demonstration on how this works. You're so see as he's going through, you can see he's taking a step, taking a sweep, taking a step, taking a sweep. That is the best way to figure out what populations you're dealing with. Um, not only does it help you figure out how many alfalfa weevils you have, it can also help you time your applications. So when you're going through and, and monitoring, um, one thing that's, that's useful, well, not useful, it's essential, is that you sample multiple places in the field. A lot of times we, um, we like to hop out of the truck, take a couple steps into the alfalfa and, and start doing our job. Um, but really you need to sample multiple areas throughout the field to get a good representative sample. Um, and for alfalfa weevils, these are, these are kind of the guidelines. So um, unless you're hitting, um, you're really trying to see if you're hitting that 20 larvae or more uh, per sweep on average. And that's, that's how you know control is warranted. I also mentioned that if you're getting to that, that 20 weevil larvae or more, and you're less than two weeks of cutting, um, your, your best option is to take an early cut. Um, and the real reason behind that is, is your harvest windows, um, your pre-harvest intervals 
for most insecticides are at least um, two weeks. So uh, a true or false question for you that you might see again later. Um, do you need to spray for weevil before you see them uh, or, or else it's too late? And that's, that's false. Um, their development is dependent on temperature, so they're not going to be present at the exact same time every year. So you might spray, if you rely on a calendar spray, you might spray too early some years. Um, you might spray too late some years. Particularly, you can, uh, when, these, when these larvae are newly hatched and they're really stuck down in those leaves, um, it can be really hard to hit them with an insecticide. Uh, back when we had Fyrodan, something that we could spray and it would stick around for a full month, um, timing probably wasn't as important as it is now. Um, so scouting, monitoring is going to be the way to, to make that best decision. Um, so throughout the state, we've had um, people saying that they've had issues controlling alfalfa weevil. Um, and so we've actually done a little bit of research around Utah um, in between 2017 and 2019 to look at some different control options for when we do hit those, those populations that are high enough that it's, it's economically uh, significant damage and we need to control that. So you'll see here, um, so this graph is showing a check. This is an untreated control. We, we didn't spray anything here. And then we have a few different insecticides across the bottom. Um, and a couple that I'd like to show you is this doxicarb high and doxicarb low. This is known as the trade name is Steward. So we have two different application rates. Um, it's a fairly expensive insecticide, but it's done very well in other other areas, other states. So we want to evaluate it for Utah and see how well it works. Um, Stewart also has a different mode of action that is novel compared to many of our other traditional or conventional insecticides, um, pretty much all of which are either an organophosphate or a pyrethroid. So our high rate of endoxicarb, uh, you can see it down here. It actually did, did pretty well. Um, gave us about 80% 80, 80 control. Um, when we dropped that rate, we actually saw that it, uh, it reduced our control uh, by quite a bit. We only ended up with about 18% reduction compared to the control at that reduced rate. Um, cobalt, on the other hand, very commonly used throughout the state we saw that it did give us a comparable level of control. Um, whirlwind, um, which chlorpyrifos is the active ingredient, uh, did okay for us. And, and then we had a few up here, uh, Mustang Max and, and Malathion um, that, that we did not really see much control so this was a little bit surprising that some of these weren't doing much for us. Um, and so we, we actually increased. So we, we went back again um, at a different site. So this is research in Spear County and Carbon County. And we repeated the experiment. Um, you'll notice that the, the rates here for Steward that we, we tried are actually a little bit higher than, than they were in the last one, in the last trial. And that's because they came out with a supplemental label for Utah. So we, we wanted to go with that. So we used the, the low as the suppression amount that they gave us um, that's on that label. So you can see our, our two rates actually performed fairly similarly. 
similarly. Um, and our other, other conventionals actually did pretty well too, um, for whatever reason that year. And this is actually just kind of showing the differences between the, the control and, and not controlled pests. So takeaways, uh, steward seems to be pretty good for us. Um, this is going to be something we might have to rely on in the future uh, more and more, especially as we see resistance to um, 3A mode of actions. Um, it's been confirmed in some states, suspected elsewhere, um, but also timing and, and maybe using old chemical could be other reasons we're seeing chemical failures. Um, so we've also been doing research on aphids. So um, common aphids, we have cowpea aphids. Um, I think I'm getting something in the chat here, but I can't pull it up. I will um, check that out when we get through here. So cowpea aphids are these shiny black guys, um, spot alfalfa aphids. Uh, have these little spots. Um, and these two, blue alfalfa aphids and spotted alfalfa aphids, um, actually cause more damage per individual because they have toxic saliva. And you can see here a field that has had stem death um, migrating throughout that field where the blue alfalfa aphids were very high. These you sample by taking a stem, clipping it at the bottom of the stem towards the soil, basically shake them around in a little bucket, and then you can go and, and collect your, your sample, count the number of aphids, and make a comparison to your treatment threshold. Again, you'll notice that those blue, and alf those blue alfalfa aphids and spotted alfalfa aphids are much more damaging compared to pea aphids and cow pea aphids. So similar to what we had done with alfalfa weevil, we did some insecticide evaluations. Um, in particular, we want to look at these Sivanto treatments, so a, a novel mode of action for Utah and see how well they did. Um, and we, we tested two rates. They did fairly well for us. Um, the, the high rate, uh, really knocked them back quickly compared to the, the low rate, um, but they, they perform statistically the same. Um, dimethoate is another one that's another systemic insecticide that's being used throughout the state. Um, and we didn't get very good control that first week that we came back and sampled. Um, but the population decreased rapidly after that. So as before, we ran this another, another year and we ran into much higher blue alfalfa aphid populations. Um, here's our economic threshold line here. So much higher pop populations than we had in 2017. Um, so we, we saw that dimethoate did do okay for us. Um, we also mixed the Savanto with the dimethoate um, it didn't really help us out that much, but that Savanto, those Savanto treatments did help us. Um, so this is going to be something that we, we probably need to think about using um, more often when we have really high populations. I'll also point out that a few of these, so like Malathion, um, it actually had higher numbers of aphids or equal number of aphids compared to the do-nothing. And that, that can be, that's likely due to us killing predators that are in the field um, that should have been there eating those aphids. So actually when we look at how predators and prey in the field kind of um, do their ecological function, when we go through and we spray insecticides, we also remove things like ladybugs, or little parasitic wasps that should be there to kill those, those aphids. So that might be why some of our conventional insecticides had more aphids than, um, 
than our control. So our, our both, both rates were similar, um, but in general, we wanna be using our higher Savanto rates when we can um, as a rotational uh, insecticide. It also helps with insecticide resistance. Dimethylate can also be one to check out. Um, what else? Oh, one, um, one insecticide that's come on to, to be registered in Utah within the past few years is called Transform. It's another, um, it's another systemic insecticide that's actually doing very, very well in Arizona and California, um, but we have not evaluated it in Utah. So we are still trying to find something that works a little bit better than dimethoate and perhaps Savanto. Grasshoppers, I'll just cover this briefly. Um, so grasshoppers can be difficult to monitor. You basically uh, mentally kind of make a square yard in your mind, um, maybe 15, 20 feet away from you, and then you walk up and then you count the number of uh, grasshoppers that hop out of that, that square yard. And that gives you your, your economic threshold. So 15 to 20 nymphs, nymphs are the young, or eight to 10 adults. The thing about controlling grasshoppers is you really have to treat early. Um, if, you, if you don't treat early, you're not going to get nearly as good of control. Um, adults can escape the insecticide and it makes it much harder to kill them. Also treating large areas. Um, if you are, you, you, if you're treating, well, we'll leave it at that. If we're treating really small areas, say you spray a five acre area, all of your neighbors, grasshoppers are gonna move in if they're not controlled. So treating very early life stage and treating large areas is how you're going to get effective control. Um, 